Atuin basically, in its simplest terms, it provides a replacement for control R, uh, such as your shell history, um, fuzzily with prefixes, however you want. Um, we store additional context for your shell history. So rather than just the time and the command, we store, you know, like what directory it was executed in, whether or not the command was successful, how long it took, that kind of thing. Um, but the main feature for me, which was the main like reason I started it, was that it also synchronizes your shell history between all of the machines you have. So maybe you have like a work laptop and a home laptop or a remote machine you work on regularly. Um, a two in will keep your shell history consistent across all of them. Yeah, that's that's really uh, the like the cherry on top. Yes, <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh, like uh, even using it with just one laptop, it will improve your uh, your developer experience by 10x uh, with respect to like the default uh, controller uh, you, you have, yes. Uh, yeah, so basically it's so to, to explain it once more, it's like instead of when you type controller, instead of the default old um, history search you have, you, you have all the list of your uh, most recent comments and uh, you can you can type and uh, it will fast the search. So yeah, it's really really handy to to find the previously run commands. Yes, and like the first thing I thought when I saw this is okay, how, how does it work, right? Because uh, like well, like how the shells that we use so bash zsh and so on allows you to to step into and uh, develop this type, this type of plugins? Sure. Um, so I made it first for ZSH, and ZSH was pretty easy, to be honest. So there's things called shell hooks, and they let you put little snippets of bash or ZSH or whatever um, to execute before or after a command. So what a Tuin does is right before a command runs, it sort of starts recording. It will input the, the command you've ran, the directory you're in, that information. And then it will run again after the command is done and it will kind of finalize it, I guess. Um, and when we finalize it, that means we can have timed it. So we know when it started, we know when it ended, we know that it's exit code, that kind of thing. Um, for bash, it was a little bit more awkward. So bash, doesn't really have as many hooks available. Um, so we used a thing called, uh, I can't remember the name now. There's a basically a shell script that's kind of like a hack to provide hooks in Bash. Um, it basically modifies the prompt to provide uh, the pre-command and post-exec stuff. Um, it works generally pretty well. There's occasionally people have strange shell configs that clash with it. Um, we now also support Fish and New Shell. Both of those provide shell hooks. And it was pretty much just a matter of um, plugging in the to in start recording and a to in stop recording. So it wasn't too bad. Okay, so basically what, what you need to do if you if you want to record the shell hook is to mm -hmm. basically in the for example in the ZSH RC file, yeah. you like you say uh, Okay, when before the command starts, run this uh, command, and after the command uh, runs, run this other one. Exactly, yeah. Okay, so you use the 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 first one to uh, record which commands you run, and the second one probably to record the context. So, for example, the how long it took to run. Exactly, yeah. So the first one we get probably half of the context and with the second one we finish it off i see i see okay that's that's a cool like that's cool to know if you want to hack and if you want to write your own uh, your own plugins i see uh okay so you said that uh, for every shell is is a bit the the mechanism is different right um yeah i'm i'm thinking right now is there like a rust library that lets you uh, write your hooks uh, uh, like just once, and it it generates all the various uh, plugins for all the various settings for the all I the shells. Don't think there is. That would be cool though. Um, <laughs> it would have made my life a lot easier, and that with a lot of contributors. So that would be really cool. 
Yeah, probably you, maybe you can extract it from other who knows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah. Um, so let's talk about uh, the so by like by just the controller and looking at the commands, it's really useful for me. But there are some other functionalities that are possible uh, by the context that uh, that you add to to the command that, that you run. Uh, which, which are mind blowing. Um, so I will ask you, what are the various contexts that uh, you can add to each command? So for example, it remembers the directory you are in, uh, how long it took. So yeah, there's the directory, the how long it took, as well as like the time that it started at. Um, we also record the host name of the machine and you executed it on. Um, we record the shell session. So a shell session is like, if you open a pane in your terminal, that's one session. Um, might notice like some terminal emulators will only record the history per session. Um, we record a few other things as well. It's like the directory. I think we covered that one already. Um, the exit code. And there's a few others, but I can't remember the whole list off the top of my head. Um, I'd like to record some more. So there's been a bunch of issues where we've discussed recording like the whole shell environment for when you executed it, um, as well as things like if you're in a Git, reposit re Git repository, record which repository you're in and that kind of thing. Uh, mm, so for, for the Git repository, how is it more useful than like just the directory? I think it's, it's almost the same, right? Almost. So in the most recent version, um, we introduced workspaces where Basically, there's like a mode for searching your history where it will show you all of the shell history for that specific Git repository. So whether you're in the root, whether you're in the source directory or whatever, it will let you focus your search to shell history that's there. Um, the problem with that is if you have two different machines and one of them has your Git, reposi your Git uh, repository cloned in like your documents folder and another one cloned in a different directory, then you a two inst does not recognize that those are the same Git repository because they're in a different path. Um, oh, okay. So if we recorded, I don't know, maybe the Git remote or something like that, then we'd be able to identify that you're in the same Git repository, even if it's in a different location. That's cool, yes. Because for example, you can run uh, like cargo run, even mm -hmm. if you're in a subdirector, not in the root. Yeah, that's, that's exactly. Cool. What was the other one? Because I had the questions also for that one. Uh, the shell and the, the env for your shell. Oh, yeah. So for the yeah. env of the shell, what, what are the use cases that uh, it unblocks? Um, so we see people use it in a lot for sort of figuring out what happened in the past. And the actual shell command does provide a lot of context, but it doesn't always provide all of the context. And sometimes you want to replay something exactly how it was. Uh, maybe you've got like some setting you've passed in through the env or something like that. And recording that too is like a proper snapshot of exactly what happened. Nice. So you, you can like go back in time and like troubleshoot what, what happened and uh, what what commands you run in which context uh, you run. Yeah, exactly. Nice. Uh, is, it, is it dangerous to record uh, environment variables for like- It can be, yeah. It can okay. be. So it's actually what part of what part of why I ended up making it encrypted, to be honest. Like most people know that they probably shouldn't be pasting like API secrets and whatever into a terminal and it's in your shell history in plain text. But a lot of people do it anyway. Um it's a lot easier than just, you know, whatever else you're gonna do, like end files or whatever. So to start with the two ends end to end encrypted, I was very scared that I would end up with a lot of AWS access keys on my server and that kind of thing. And also I think storing people's history in plain text is like a non-starter for a lot of people. So for both of those reasons, it is end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, kind of doesn't completely eliminate the risk of synchronizing secrets, um, which is part why I haven't started working on it yet. Um, one thing I did add in, or well, I don't think it's released yet, but it will be in the next release. Um, is sort of a regex for filtering secrets out. So for instance, it will automatically not save history if it contains what it thinks is an AWS access token, um, so that kind of thing. Um, but at the end of the day, there is like a slight risk. Um, so it can't be completely eliminated. 
I see. But so uh, Altwin uses um, SQLite uh, database to record uh, all, all the commands you run. Is it also that uh, end to end encrypted? Um, so the SQLite that's on your local machine, it is not stored encrypted, so it is stored in plain text. Um, it would be really nice to store it encrypted, but offering a very fast search and storing mm. data encrypted is, is kind of difficult. Um, something I'd like to improve, and we're actually working on a new sync method where some of the data is stored on disk encrypted too. Ah, oh, nice, I see. Uh, like, have you thought about, uh, I don't know if it's like, in theory, you can mm -hmm. uh, decrypt the database, then store, uh, store uh, the the content of the database not encrypted in memory. And then, I don't know, you can have this daemon that runs and uh, the Atwin shell queries this daemon. I, have you thought about having a daemon, long running daemon? So yeah, I, I did originally. Um, it was sort of an intentional design decision at the beginning to not have a daemon, um, mostly because I think at the time at work, I'd been bitten by sort of demons that hadn't quite been written right and wouldn't behave properly, wouldn't listen to signals properly and would sort of be a zombie process and whatever. Um, so it was an intentional design decision to not go for a demon, but we're kind of at the point now where in order to do some of the features that I really want to do, um, a demon is pretty much required. So there is a branch I started working on a long time ago to add a demon. I'm going to revive it at some point, but yeah. Oh, I see. Great. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you are, I think, yeah, first uh, you're storing the commands in a proper database and not in a mm -hmm. plain text file as like shells do by default, which is great. Uh, like, have you, why, okay, yeah, why uh, you decided to uh, use SQLite and uh, are you considering using other databases? Yeah, so um, SQLite, mostly because I'd, I'd used it in previous projects, I was very familiar with it. Um, I was very comfortable with the safety guarantees it has, I guess. Um, I, the biggest problem I did not want to have is be six months in and suddenly the database is corrupted because of some edge case that nobody knew about. SQLite is probably the most widely deployed database ever. Um, it's way more tested than anything else. It's very, very fast. Um, and that kind of thing. So just from a safety and performance angle, it was almost a no-brainer. Um, it actually has fairly decent full text search modules. Uh, we don't actually use them in a two in yet, but they're pretty good too. Um, the other question you had was about other databases. So yes. I, I've always wanted to keep SQLite as the sort of source of truth, like the ultimate, you know, this is where your shell history is and it's pretty safe in SQLite. Um, but much as I did just say the full text search module is pretty good, it doesn't quite give you the full flexibility that a proper search engine does. Um, so I'm actually blanking on the name. I think it's like Tortelli or something. Um, there's a Rust project for like a proper search module, um, which Conrad, uh, one of the other maintainers, he had a go at using in a branch somewhere. And I think it would be cool to try that out. Yeah, uh, yeah. Hi, Conrad. You're awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> Conrad's great. Yes. Uh, so I missed it uh, a bit. So it's it's a completely different database. This search. That, okay. So it's the, yeah. so you're thinking about replacing the SQLite database with this other database. No, so SQLite would still be the ultimate record of your shell history, um, but at times we would ingest that into an actual search database. Um, okay, so you will have two databases. Yep. Okay, cool. So Luciano asked in the chat, uh, where did the idea of creating Adwin came from? And I think you said mm -hmm. mainly because you wanted to sync the your shell history between um, different computers, different laptops. So uh, now is the good is the is a great time to ask you how this sync between different machines uh, work. Sure. So it's it's in a little bit of a state of flux right now, but the history of it is originally uh, kind of at the moment, and it will be changing soon. It's based on timestamps. So 
the Atuan client knows that it has, say, 10,000 lines of shell history stored, and then the server knows that it has 9,000 stored, say, and the client will ask the server what it's got stored. And if the client has more, it's going to keep trying to upload shell history until the count on the server matches. Um, and the other way around works too. So if the server has more, it'll keep downloading until the counts match. Um, I never thought it would work amazingly well when I first wrote it. I thought this would be good enough and it worked for me, but I didn't think it would scale that well. Um, it has worked a lot better and I think there's been a few edge cases mostly relating to timestamps being very awkward, um, which have mostly been fixed. Um, but we're actually working on a new sync method at the moment, which is rolled out in the newest to and it's just not used for history yet. And it basically gives each user um, several linked lists and um, it tries to keep the lists in sync based on the, the IDs of each node in the list and it works much more reliably. Oh, okay. So you're, you're changing this mechanism a bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but so the sync is not peer to peer. So the laptops don't mm. sync between each other. There is a client and a server, right? Correct. Yes. Uh, so is the server uh, another binary or is it the same admin binary that can do both uh, the client and the server? So currently it's one binary that does both. Um, this was also very intentional in the beginning. I wanted, I wanted it to be very easy for anyone to host a server. And if you have a two in installed, you can, you can go for it with running a server if you want to. Um, Currently, there is a separate binary you can opt into. So Conrad has this one on his GitHub. And basically, we were playing with the idea of having multiple different database backends. So the server at the moment uses Postgres. Uh, a lot of people wanted SQLite for sort of ease of deployment reasons. Um, so there is another binary which uses SQLite as the backend. Oh, I see. So the client uses uh... Uh, SQL light while well, the server uses Postgres. Yep. Nice. I see. Um, and so you, um, yeah, we'll go back probably to the server uh, in a moment. Yeah, so sure. we, we have a question from the chat from mm -hmm. Warren. Uh, while working on Atwin, were there any particular difficult challenges that stole your sleep that night? <laughs> I remember one, it happened in May. May the 6th, actually, I remember the exact day. Um, <laughs> so there hasn't been any sort of major incidents or downtime or anything like that throughout the history of it. However, there was something I noticed. It was the day before I realized what was going on. I noticed there was like really high HTTP traffic from a few users and I wasn't really sure what was going on. Um, the next morning, a few people were complaining that or had reported that their Turin wasn't completing sync. And it turns out what the problem was, was that again, timestamp based sync, um, a two in syncs in page, sort of pages of history basically. And what had happened was in one page, all of the history had the same timestamp, which shouldn't really be able to happen. Um, but what had happened was that there was a bug in the bash importer, which meant that we were only so Bash doesn't have timestamps per history. Sorry, I'm kind of rambling a little bit. Um, so when we're, in, <laughs> when we're importing history, we sort of take one line, we don't have a timestamp for it, so we just give it the current timestamp. And then we get the next line and we just increment the timestamp and keep going so they don't all have the same timestamp. Um, but the problem that had been introduced was that we were only incrementing it by a nanosecond. And what I didn't realize when I reviewed this code was that Postgres's timestamp type does not have nanosecond precision. It only has microsecond precision, which should be good enough, right? Um, which meant that when it was being saved, they all had the same time, um, which meant that the sync logic we had, which made assumptions about newer history having a different timestamp, um, just wasn't completing okay. And it kept returning the same page over and over and over again. Um, so sync was not completing. It took me ages to figure this out. And then obviously, it's difficult because the binary is out there. It's not just like a web page where I can roll back a deploy or deploy a fix or whatever. It's got to kind of think of a workaround that people can run and then ship a fix. Um, 
so that did steal some sleep i woke up very early and had to fix that but it wasn't too bad that's a subtle bug really yes <laughs> yeah i know right <laughs> um i wanted to, so i have two questions the first one is how did mm -hmm. you notice uh, the increased http traffic uh, do you have so yeah let's uh, let's talk about this the you are uh, Basically, you are hosting an Atwin server, right? For for free, for uh, mm -hmm. for everyone to sync their history and to end encrypted, right? That's right. Yeah. So you notice an increased HTTP um, uh, request in in your machine. So how are you monitoring it? So um, I haven't really put any proper Prometheus metrics into a turn server yet. I'd like to, it's on the to-do list. Um, but I do export metrics from Nginx and from Postgres on that machine. And then I've just got a Grafana dashboard where I keep an eye on what's going on. Like I track whether both the disks on the server are okay, how much CPU it's using, HTTP requests, size of the database, that kind of thing. I see. Uh, yeah. And, uh... Thank you. And the second question I have is, uh, I didn't understand why you are like doing plus one in the bash history. Can't you just do mm -hmm. like date uh, now, something like that? Yeah. So it was probably, I think we were concerned that on a very, very fast machine using date now would return the same date for a couple of entries. And we wanted to avoid two items of history having precisely the same timestamp. Um, in the end, to a user, it does look like they're all in the same second. Um, but the important distinction was that in storage, they were distinct timestamps. I see. Um, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm wrong, but I think there is a, I don't know if it's in the standard library, but like um, Linux for sure has like a monotonic, uh, uh, timestamp, but maybe it's not available on other operating systems. I don't know. Yeah, no, um, it's kind of ironic because part of the problem happened because I did make assumptions, but I was trying to avoid assumptions about the clock. So I was like, well, if I just take the current time as the start and then increment on each one, there's no chance that it will be yeah, a problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, but obviously that was also the problem. So <laughs> instead other uh, shell history gives you the timestamp. So it's, it's not a, an issue. It was only an issue with bash because pretty much all the other shells do store the timestamp by default. Um, although I'm not sure if ZSH does at the moment. I think it does. Mm, I see. So we have a couple of questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. So the first one, first one is from Varanjan. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Have you looked at using BonsaiDB as the database? I never heard of BonsaiDB. Me neither. I'm going to just open a browser tab so I can look it up afterward. <laughs> okay. That's cool. So, uh, Varanjan, if you uh, know why Ellie should look at BonsaiDB for this particular use case, tell us in the chat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Solution is, is saying someone has to ask how much <laughs> is the hosting cost for you at, the, at, the, at this point. And uh, yeah, like it's, it's very related to to my to my question to my next mm -hmm. question because like you are providing this server for free for everyone and uh, it's it's really generous from from you yes so I wanted to ask you why you're you're providing this service for free and uh, if you're thinking about uh, offering uh, paid plans and stuff like that sure um so why I'm hosting it for free, um, yes. originally I, I built a turn when I was off work with some, some personal problems for a bit and it was just something to do, scratching my own itch. And then when I released it online, I, I thought, well, you know, um, barely anyone's going to use it so I can just host it for a few people for free. It's not a problem. Um, a few people used, a few more people used it than I thought, uh, at the moment, the server costs aren't too bad. It's about 50 or 60 pounds a month, I think, um, plus whatever I pay for backups, which is not very much. Um, so that's not too bad. The issue we are facing is that kind of the rate of growth is increasing. Um, so at one point it was using like a gigabyte a week, maybe, which wasn't awful. Uh, it's now using a gigabyte of storage every like day and a half. Um, mm. So 
at the moment it all fits on one machine. Um, I can get some bigger discs and stuff, but eventually I, I kind of want to be able to have slightly more reliability and the storage might increase too much where it needs to be spread out a bit better. Um, but it's okay for now. I think overall I've been paying probably 50 pounds a month for I think three years nearly something like that. It was a bit cheaper in the beginning. Um, but also since maybe nine months ago, something like that, it's been covered by sponsors, which has been great. So, yeah. So definitely if you enjoy Atwin, uh, check out her uh, GitHub sponsors, uh, especially if you use the <laughs> sync feature because yeah, she's paying for it. And like one gigabyte uh, and a half per day is, is a lot because like you're syncing it like uh, command history. So how, how much is like a command uh, on average? Uh, if you <laughs> buy it, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's very tricky to measure because all I can do is query the average length of the encrypted record, which mm. is going to be longer than the actual record length. And it also contains a bunch of metadata and stuff. Um, so I think, on average, it was kilobytes per user. It wasn't too much um, per per line per user. Um, yeah, but yeah. it's very difficult to measure. Uh, I think in terms of lines of history, which I can measure, the mm -hmm. biggest amount we've had in a day was three or four million, I think. Um, most days are around 150 to 200,000 per day. Um, that's so, huge. Congrats. Yeah, that's quite a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, and the second part of the question was uh, if, you have you if you have thought about offering some paid plans of, mm. of some sort. Yes. Um, I think I might do at some point. I'd like to be very careful about doing it. I definitely don't want to rug pull anything people can already do. Um, so with, we are working on some additional features which are going to cause way more bandwidth and storage usage on the server. And I think those are probably going to have to be paid. Um, obviously, like free and open source. And if you self-host, you can do it. You can have everything for free, um, plus your time, I guess. Um, mm. But there is going to be a point where in order to ensure that both the infrastructure stays up and also that the project stays sustainable, um, which is something I've thought about a lot, uh, then may maybe paid plans in the future. Yeah, that makes total sense, yes. So we have a few other uh, comments. Uh, so the first one is from Ranjan, uh, which says that uh, BonsaiDB is a Rust key value store with the at rest hmm. encryption. Uh, so yeah, I will- That sounds you. cool. Thank you. I'll definitely check it out. Thank you. And then Quentin Tarantino, uh, thank you for following me. I'm a, a fan of yours. Is uh, asking for um, it's a feature request probably. Is official uh, SQLite support for self-hosting coming? Probably. Uh, I'm going to give a very non-committal answer. Um, I think probably yes for a bunch of reasons. It's going to make self-hosting easier for most people, I suspect, um, and also it will be. A bit easier for testing and that kind of thing. Um, I will probably end up bringing Postgres out of tree if that's the case. So Postgres can be sort of an additional thing that I maintain mostly for myself and probably a couple of others. I know there's a few people that rely on Postgres and want to stick with using it. Um, but I think for the average user, SQLite is going to be the thing. Um, it's actually very hard to know because I don't really track anything at all. Um, so I'm mostly, there's an issue on my GitHub, there's a discussion about whether SQLite is something people are interested in. Um, so if anyone feels very strongly, I would really appreciate if you went and commented that. Thank you. So we have another question. Oops, sorry. We have another question <laughs> from Arun. Do you have any tips to promote open source projects? How did you make people hear about Atwin? Um, I don't know whether what I did was a thing to do to promote it or just pure luck, um, but Atuin was the first project I released where I actually put a bit of effort into the README. Um, <laughs> so I tried to make it sort of very clear what it was, very easy to set up and get started. Um, and I think the first time a bunch of people saw it was just from Twitter. Um, I got a few retweets and it spread around that way. 
Um, but otherwise, it's mostly just word of mouth um, and probably the sort of speaking and podcasts and stuff, I guess. Um, but I think generally having a nice readme is, is probably the most important thing. Most people aren't going to look at your readme for more than a few seconds. And if they can't figure out what's going on, then, then they're not going to use your project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely good advice. Yeah, also you have a, a really good uh, website for the documentation and so on. Yes. You yeah, can thank follow, you. By the way, you can follow the AtwinSH page on Twitter. If I remember correctly. Yes. That's right. Nice. Yeah, but by the way, I don't think it's pure luck. Uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's a great project. Thank um, you. And yeah, maybe there's some like people in uh, in offices or while they're sharing the screen, maybe they type control R and the other the other guy says, hey, wh what's that? <laughs> exactly. The coolest thing was when I first saw someone at work using it. That was really cool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, the same, like the other day, I saw a colleague of mine using control R. Mm -hmm. Without anything before, I was using um, Z F F Z F something like that for the but I replaced it with Adwin, and so I linked the project uh, immediately after. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so Luciano is asking is asking if you are using Dogusarus for the docs from the look of it. I think yes. Yeah. Yeah, we are. Yeah, uh, I'm using it as well. It's a, it's a great way to yeah, build docs. Good. Yes. Um, so cool. I wanted to ask you uh, how the encryption between the Adwin client and the Adwin server works. I think it's one of the most critical parts of the of the system because, like as you said, leaking uh, API keys is not fun. <laughs> no, exactly. Um, so currently, the sync method uses Libsodium. Uh, it's libsodium secret box. So it's symmetric encryption. We generate a key, store that on your machine and encrypt all of your history with that. It's been the case ever since the beginning. Um, we basically, we're planning on doing something different for the new sync that's probably gonna come out in the next release. Um, Conrad actually wrote a really good blog post about that. So um, people go and check that out. It's on a twin.sh slash blog. There's uh, an article about how all our encryption works, which probably summarize it better than me. Um, Conrad did a really good job of researching that. Um, yeah, thank you. It uses Pasito tokens, which I remembered as pasta tokens, um, but Pasito tokens and I can't remember the exact cipher name. It's one of the cha-cha ones, but yeah. Okay, I don't know what you're talking about, uh, but uh, yeah, if you, do you want to speak more about it, or maybe Conrad mainly were the? Uh yeah, it was a, it was something Conrad focused on mostly. Okay, so okay. I'm gonna. No problem. Yeah, no, it's cool. I'll send you the blog post link if you want to share that. It's yeah, probably better. Absolutely. Uh, so I was I was wondering if uh, the like how do you generate the key? Is it linked with the uh, there is some kind of username and password authentication with the server. Um, so there is username and password with the server, and then the encryption key is totally separate. It's not derived from the username and password. Um, that's something we actually spent a lot of time thinking about for the new encryption method was like whether or not we derive it from any sort of memorable information or not. Um, one of the most common problems we have is that people forget their um, their login details and we kind of ended up with we're just going to stick with the uh the encryption key just being a token that you have to put in a password manager or something like that um there's actually a branch up of using the mac os keychain and i think mm. it uses the linux and windows one as well as a really cool rust project that does that it's called keychain rs i think um just to store the encryption keys so people don't lose it um i'm still not a hundred percent happy with our key management stuff because it still relies on people remembering pieces of information, which people are very, very bad at doing. Um, so I'd like to change it, but there's nothing that screams out as being the obvious solution. Okay. And uh, different laptops have different uh, keys, oh. right? It's currently a shared secret. Okay. So you, do, for example, if I, um, like if I register to uh, to in from one laptop, uh, this secret is sent to the other laptop. 
from the server? Uh, no, so we've left sort of the key management up to the user for the time being, oh, which okay, okay, is okay. kind of, it makes our lives a lot easier. Um, whether or not it makes the user's lives easier is probably debatable. Um, but no, for now, you have to copy paste it. Um, originally, it was displayed to the user as like a base 64 kind of string, um, which sucked. And now it's like a little haiku, kind of like, um, I think we stole a package from the crypto Rust people, um, but it uses like a little haiku thing in words. So you can like read it basically. I see. There's a question from Luciano, which is asking why Paseto and not JWT starts the flame war. Um, I, I think it's covered in the blog post we had. I remember <laughs> discussing this a bunch at the time. Uh, we settled on Pesito, Pesetto, however you want to say it. Um, I think some of the properties were a little bit better than JWT. We came to the conclusion. Um, I don't, I don't remember all the details to be honest. Okay. I always use the JWT, so I will check out Pesito <laughs> or Paseto after this. Nice. Um, yeah. So. I have some other questions about um, mm -hmm. Arduino in general. So one thing that we didn't uh, mention is that uh, you can see some stats of your usage from Arduino, right? Yeah. Okay. Can you can you tell us a bit more of uh, how sure. it works? Sure. So. Currently, the stats are, I don't know, they're, they're like the minimum. It's something we want to explore a lot more, but it will basically analyze the history you have and it will tell you the commands you use most. Um, so you can filter it by all time. So all of the commands you've used since Arduin has sort of knowledge of. Um, but you can also filter it by like specific days or specific months. So if you want to know like which commands you used in January of last year, you can do that, or you can know your most popular commands overall. Um, I found it useful for knowing what things I need to alias. So if I have commands that are kind of long that I use all the time, um, maybe I want to alias them. So getting some stats on that's really useful. Um, we don't really make the most of the information we have just yet, mostly because displaying that in a terminal is kind of difficult. Um, but doing things like show your most popular directory, the time of day where you're most active, um, that kind of thing um, might be cool in the future. Nice. I see. So yeah, from yeah, it's cool that from from these stats you can see like all all your habits a bit at the terminal, and uh, yeah, as you said, you can. You can set, um, I don't know, alias or uh, maybe you get, yeah, like, do you have any examples of uh, people like changing their workflow uh, thanks to these admin stats even by yourself? What alias yeah, do you Yeah, so, set? I mean, again, aliases, a lot of people have told me they've used it to inform the aliases they should make. Um, I've seen a few people using it to, like, iteratively build up shell scripts. So when they're working on like a longer shell script, they can kind of build it up inside of a tune, which I thought was really cool. Um, but that kind of thing. I see. Yeah, yeah, that's that's awesome, yes. Uh, yeah, actually I never run Arduin stats, so <laughs> I'm collecting a few uh, and a few usage and then I will I will use it, yes. Yeah, I run Git checkout all the time. <laughs> Sorry, just someone in the chat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, you, you have Tivus and so on. Yes. Um, so, a very classic question: like, what are the main challenges you faced while uh, developing uh, Arduin? Mm -hmm. Main challenges, I, I would say, getting out like a. <laughs> getting out like sorry, I just saw the chat. I'll get into that in a minute. But um, getting a V, like getting a V zero out, was pretty easy. Like getting something that worked for my ZSH on my machine and synced my history was not too complicated. A lot of the problems came with like all of the edge cases of different shells, different operating systems, different setups, uh, different like developers love to customize their shell prompt or their terminal and whatever. And there's all sorts of different plugins that at various times it hasn't necessarily worked that well with or has had sort of performance issues. Um, there was, I can't remember any specific examples now, but it's it's more the the, the variety of setups that Arturian's used on. I think someone was running it on a Steam Deck once, which I thought was really cool. <laughs> um, but 
loads of people run it on Android phones. We had some issues where people were failing to build on, I can't remember then, it's like Termius or something. There's an Android terminal thing. Um, but making sure it works beyond just my machine was maybe the biggest problem. Um, and more of a sort of less technical one was just managing the sort of issues and pull requests and everything else. Um, making sure that I sort of balance the time between like solving other people's problems and taking the project in the direction I want to has been pretty difficult. Do you have any suggestions in this area? Um, I think just prioritizing time makes sense. I think it's very tempting to just say yes when someone puts a lot of time and energy into a pull request but if it's not something you want to merge or not something you're confident in it's usually better to err on the side of caution um i learned that one a bit earlier in the project but yeah it's uh kind of an ongoing lesson i'm learning i think yeah I, like i have a, a um an advice for the people who listen maybe if you have a big pull request in mind First, create an issue and discuss with the maintainers if they want to merge it. <laughs> or drop on Discord, like either of them either of them works. I've had people open like massive amounts of work before and I've been like, I feel very, very bad saying no to this because this definitely took like a whole day, but also it's just not something I want to merge. So it's, um, yeah, it's not the easiest thing. Um, yeah. And also, yeah, as you were saying, uh, I think that when you run something that, uh, um, when you have something that runs on so many different devices, is really hard to, to to manage. I think it's a bit the difference between like front end and back end. Mm -hmm. Back end, you say, okay, my binary runs on Ubuntu twenty two, while on front end it runs on every possible browser and so on. And yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. I hadn't actually thought about it like that, but that's no, that's a very good comparison. Yeah. Uh, so we have a question from Morun. <laughs> Any plans to, inc to incorporate uh, machine learning, AI, and do evil things with the user data? I think it, it could be a, a use case for some paid features. <laughs> yeah. So um, I the thing is, if again, if it wasn't end-to-end -end encrypted, there are so many evil things we could do. Um, but because it is, it kind of limits it to things that we can run on a user's computer. Um, the ML things I have sort of considered would be like the search ordering and prioritization is good enough, but I think it could be a lot better. So we could maybe use some sort of model to learn from the user habits and sort of suggest what they want to run um, more, more than just on sort of very defined attributes like directory. We could just try and be smart about it. But um no we can't really do any evil things at the moment <laughs> but speaking about evil things like mm -hmm. for example if i uh type uh, by mistake an api key is there a way to delete it from the local history and uh, maybe even remotely even if it's encrypted sure um deletion's been a tricky one to be honest uh for the first probably two years of the project, you couldn't actually delete anything if it had been sy synchronized because um, imagine you've written something locally, it's synced up to the server and then it's synced out to all of your other machines. Ensuring that it's been deleted from all of them was a non-trivial problem, I think, um, especially when the sync relies on knowing how many records you have on each machine. Um, at the moment, we do have deletion. It's maybe more of like a soft deletion, I guess. Um, so if it's synchronized locally, it will be deleted. There's no, you know, if you run strings on your a 2 n database, it won't show up anymore. Um, on the server, it still exists as a record. Um, it's just marked as deleted. Um, I would like to maybe tombstone it more and actually delete the record data out. Um, but that's probably going to be a thing for the new sync we're releasing. Um, we can do some much sort of more solid deletions there. I see. Uh, I have a question. So have you thought about, I don't know, it just came to my mind, so maybe mm -hmm. it's a stupid thing. Have you th thought about uh, using like a database that automatically syncs uh, between various instances of it, 
I don't know. Um, like for yeah, you. I looked at a few at the time. I think I wrote this in like twenty. I think I made the tech decisions about databases in 2020, 2021, something like that. The choices were, they would work maybe just for my use case, but making them work in a multi-user setup wasn't ideal, mm. or maybe the server was great, but then the client was a bit lacking, um, or maybe they were meant for like JavaScript in a browser, which is not the use case here. Um, so nothing screamed like the perfect solution for this. Um, there were a few things that I could have maybe hacked to the point where they'd work. But at that point, you might as well just build something that solves your use case. I see. Yeah, where I'm coming from is like all this uh, local first uh, web development database that uh, are popping There's quite there. a few for the browser. There's just not yeah. so many that are outside of the browser. Yeah, it would be cool if there was like a Rust library that you can just statically link into your binary and manage the database for you. So that's actually where we're going with the new Atuin sync. Um, the thing I released in Atuin 16 uh, is the key value store. It's kind of an experiment, but it lets you just sync like keys and values, like whatever you want. Um, because we realized while designing the new sync that a 2 wasn't really synchronizing shell history. It was just syncing arbitrary blobs because we were syncing encrypted data. So it wasn't specific to shell history. Um, so we're actually thinking of not right now because it's still an experiment, but soon encouraging people to build on top of it. Nice. Do you do you plan to... Uh, okay, so, it's syn so is it specifically for... Uh, um, syncing shell history or you are planning on doing a library that is generic? Um, we'll probably break it out into a library yeah, for well, just uh, synchronizing. I will yeah. definitely check it out, yes. Seems exciting. Yeah, it'd be cool. Huh. And yeah, apart from this feature, what, what other feature, features do you plan to add to Arduino or you are excited about? Um, God, there's way more features I want to build than I have time to build. Um, which is very frustrating. Um, but sort of on my mind at the moment, there's the new sync that I've mentioned before. I want to try and make that solid and bring history on top of it. Um, there's a bunch of general user experience improvements, like improving the search mode, improving the sorting for the search mode, um, that kind of thing, just to make it feel... We want to minimize the time you spend in a turn, basically. Like the less time you spend using it, the better, because that means you've found what you're looking for sooner. Um, bigger than that is there's a web UI in the works. Um, you can sign in with your to and username, password and encryption key. It's a full, um, offline, like it doesn't use a server at all. It's a full a to and client. It synchronizes and stores it in, um, index DB, I think. And we can use that to display like much more interesting statistics because we can be more flexible with the UI in the web. Um, And there's also some real-time sync I'd really like to do. Um, I'm not sure if it's useful to most users, um, but for some users, having it sort of immediately sync out to every other machine you have online would be would be cool. Yeah, those are very exciting features. Yes, I can imagine <laughs> that it takes time to to build them. Yeah. Um, we have another question from Aron, which is a person which has very few side projects, so he's asking, <laughs> Just do, you a have, few. <laughs> yes, do you have any side side projects that you work on? Oh, God. Um, so I, I released one over the weekend called Yeet, um, but it's basically like a, it's not at all very polished and it's pretty much just for my use case, but it's like an image uploader and proxy. So I rebuilt my website for the thousandth time in the last month and I wanted somewhere to store images that wasn't just in a Git repo. I wanted to store them in S3, ideally. I did not want to pay S3 bandwidth costs. Um, so it will basically, you make a curl request, it uploads them to S3, stores them in a little bucket, and then it will handle optimizing them and caching them in response. Um, I actually built that because I wanted something really small I could finish in like half a day or a day or so. Um, because much as I love working on a tour and it's one of those like really big projects that needs a lot of thought and just having something tiny I can finish is really nice. Um, I have a bunch of electronics projects as well that I like working on. Um, 
my motorbike is currently in parts in the garage and I like playing around with that. But yeah, we'll see. Do you, do you find uh, working on on other projects sometimes like refreshing that you need to a bit step up from your main side project? Yeah, so I I mean, I, I started programming a really long time ago for fun. It wasn't like a degree and then a job that I ended up starting with. I started it for pleasure and it is sometimes nice just to work on something that's almost inconsequential, I guess. Um, if I mess up with an a two-in release, I break a whole bunch of people's shells, which is not what I want to do. Um, just messing around with some new technology I've not played with before and just sort of building something silly, I guess, is, is fun. Um, and sometimes you need to just sort of step back and then when you go back, you're refreshed and you've got different ideas. Yeah. Uh yeah, now that I think about it, releasing Godwin is very scary. Do you have any, like, any test, uh, like, what are the, like, some tests that you developed to, uh, to increase your confidence when, uh, uh, when releasing? Like, probably you have unit tests. Do you have some kind of... Yeah, we have a decent amount of unit tests. We have some integration tests as well. Slightly more recently, they just sort of test the can users sign up. There was one release where we didn't realize we'd broken the register endpoint until the next day, um, <laughs> which obviously needed a patch. Um, the other things are sort of... I mean, we do need more tests. I think that's true of every project. But what I do is I run the latest branch, the latest on the main branch on my personal laptop, but I run the latest release on my work laptop just to make sure there's no sort of weird sync breaking changes going on that I've not realized through testing. Um, and it is very helpful that I do use it pretty much all day, every day. Um, you kind of catch a few bugs there, but, but yeah. Um, there's a few people on our Discord as well who regularly update to the latest commit and test it out. That's awesome, yes. Yeah, uh, probably it's a good strategy using use it, it using it yourself before releasing it. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you have uh, unit tests, uh, sorry, integration tests that runs the binary and uh, check the standard output or stuff like that. Not yet, because we haven't been very good at having it stable. Um, the thing that bothers me most, to be honest, is that the UI isn't really that tested. Um, mm. The code for it is. In the nicest terms, very organic. Um, it kind of grew over the years to fit like various things we hadn't thought of. And it could do with a restructuring and restructuring in a way that's easier to test. I see. So I have a, uh, let's say, more philosophical question. Yeah, so we, So we, we've seen in the latest years desktop environments that and, and apps, in general, GUI apps, that evolved uh, that like they are more user friendly, they have more features and so on. Uh, instead, if we look at the terminals, like if 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 you install a, a, I don't know a Ubuntu an Ubuntu from ten years ago, and you install Ubuntu again today, like the terminal is almost the same, right? And mm -hmm. Adwin is to me is an example of how you can improve. Uh, the experience of of, a, of the user using a, a terminal. So, uh, what what's your opinion on this? Do you think that terminals should uh, uh, should be more user friendly? Should evolve uh, in some way? Do you think that uh, distros should look into this kind of stuff? I think they absolutely should be. Um, I only start use the terminal as much as I did because maybe 10 years ago I was very stubborn and I decided that on the Linux distro I was on I was going to learn to use the terminal I uninstalled all the file browsers and everything and I was like right I'm gonna get comfortable with this thing um and I think a lot of devs especially newer devs now have no real reason to use the terminal um not regularly anyway maybe running a few commands and whatever but nothing nothing much and I think that anytime you try and approach it, it's very old feeling, I guess. Um, so I think it can be updated and I don't think that has to mean that it's less powerful. Um, so like there's all the new shells you're seeing now and um, those are really cool to see people working on. There's like even just newer prompts and newer newer tooling, um, even like the 
kind of there's lots of Rust tools that replace standard old Unixy tools, which are really nice. Um, so I think it can be updated, and I think we don't have to make anything less powerful. So yeah, I think you said the uh, so you you did a brilliant uh, uh, talk at FOSDEM about Arduin. I encourage everyone mm -hmm. to uh, look at it. And I think in that talk you said that you use uh, Starship. I think yeah. it's called. Yeah, yeah, I, I like it. Starship. Yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a prompt written in Rust. I also use it. Mm, like, what what else do you think uh, we can improve? Do you do you use other cool C like tools that you would like to share with us? Yeah, um, I think the two I've used the longest, at least, replace just LS and Cat. Um, I use them, oh, and Z-Oxide too, actually. But I use, LS is probably, if you look at my Arduino stats, which I put on our Discord, LS is my most ran command. Um, thank you. And making the output a little bit nicer by default just made the shell feel friendlier, I suppose. Um, and then BAT, I think it's called, I have an alias to cat, so oh, thank you. Um, having the output of whenever you're trying to see what's in a file, I guess, having that be syntax highlighted and have line numbers is really nice. Um, I also enjoy Z-Oxide. That's, um, I don't know, it just makes things feel a bit better, like a smarter CD, but yeah. Uh, I, I use I use uh, BAT as well. Uh, mm -hmm. What's Z-Oxide? It's like a, I'll put a link. It's basically, da -da. It's like a smarter CD command, so it keeps track of the directories you're in, and um, you can like instead of typing the full path, you can just type the directory name, and it tries to figure out which one you mean. Okay, is the one you invoke with uh, Z? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Hey, I think it's it's a raster, it's a raster right to another project. Yeah, 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 I see. Cool. I will check it out. Yes. <laughs> um, so. Arun probably is asking, ironically, <laughs> if you've considered writing out in Antic, I will ask, I will ask his, like, feel free to answer, but I will also add, have you looked into Zeek? I actually it? haven't. It's It's been on my to-do list. There's a long list of projects that I want to explore and languages I want to explore and technologies I want to check out. I just I just haven't had time. Um, I would really like to check out Zeek, though. Yeah, me too, yes. But as you said... Uh, Prioritization, yes. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> okay, so Alberto is asking, opinions on the refreshing look of work terminal. Might that increase the usage of terminal for new new devs? I think so. Um, I think new devs are probably used to things like VS Code, which I think VS Code's great. Personally, I don't use it. Um, for some, I'm very used to Vim kind of reasons. Um, but I think the fact that you open it up and it pretty much installs all the things you need for you, the environment's nice, it's already there. And then if that then if developers who are used to that kind of experience go to the terminal where you know you're greeted by a blinking cursor, nothing's set up for you, there's nothing there already, and you've kind of just got to figure out what to do yourself. Um, especially when you don't even know what to Google to make it nice. Um, I think having a nicer out of the box experience is is probably a good thing. Yeah, I think I think the same. And probably we like we are missing the input of new devs because yeah. maybe they are like they are scared from of the terminal. They they just don't use it, and we are so used to it because and so we we don't think about uh, improving it that much. Yes. But it's great exactly. that projects like Arduin and, and Warp make this uh, better, yes. Uh, 